our help center is on a subdomain of our main marketing site. So, you know, we have access to the Google analytics through our marketing team. So that's really important. I can see what are our highest performing articles, and then I can try to understand why. Are they structured in a different way that's ranking them higher? Or is it just that people want the content from these? And, and we can expand that in our content set. But are there things this article is doing that I can replicate in others, right? Analytics gives you that kind of insight. Welcome to the Knowledge Base Ninjas podcast where Gallery Ram Kumar of Document360 finds the best SaaS self-service knowledge bases in the world and then interviews their creators. Let's get started with today's episode. Good day, everyone. Our guest today is David Ingram, Senior Technical Writer at Medellia. So welcome, David, to our Knowledge Base Ninjas podcast series. How are you doing today? I am so well. Uh, thank you so much. It's it's truly a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited about our chat today. Fantastic. So, David, please help us understand a little bit more about yourself and uh, how did you get into this uh, profession? Who was your motivator? Absolutely. So, it, it has been a bit of a journey. Um, so, right now, I'm a senior technical writer at Medallia, uh, working on the Mindful brand. So our team is a bit unique. We're kind of a multidisciplinary team. So not only are we technical writers, but we also dabble in graphic design. We kind of do that ourselves. We dabble in video production. We dabble in e-learning design. Um, it, I'm very grateful to be a part of a team that has such a, a you know a, a wide capacity for content creation in general. Um, so I've been a technical writer for about the past seven or eight years. Uh, but I started as a freelancer way back in 2009. So uh, the economy was a little weird. I just got out of college and I and I discovered, hey, I don't have to really look for a job. I can do this writing thing as a freelancer. So I did that <laughs> through most of my 20s. Um, eventually was drawn to technical writing in the software space where, you know, I, I just love the new challenges that come up each day. I love learning about new technologies. Um, so in my role over the years, I've had opportunities to do pretty much everything there is to do in tech writing. But coincidentally, I've become a little bit of an expert on content migrations, moving huge sets of content from one knowledge base platform to another, just because we've done it several times. Great. So I think you're the best person to talk about challenges because you love challenges. And you did mention that you specialize, you kind of started specializing in content migration between platforms. So can you help us uh, with some of the challenges that organizations encounter when moving the contents? Absolutely. So there are key challenges and, you know, our team, we learned some easy lessons. We learned some hard lessons. And about our third time doing this, we, we, we were all kind of experts and knew what to expect. So I'll talk about some challenges, but also some critical questions to kind of ask beforehand or during the process, and then a couple of best practices. So First key question, does your existing info architecture fit within the capabilities of the new system? You know, for example, how heavily do you use reusable content? And is that going to work just as well in the new system? And what do you have to do to map your reusable content from system A to system B? Um, uh, another challenge, do you have gated access for different clients? One client can see this article, one client can see that, or different subscription tiers or things like that. Does the new system support something like that? Um, do you have completely separate navigation per product? Do you separate and silo content like that? You know, our team works on uh, more than five distinct products. So that's something we have to consider. Is everything going to be together? Can everything be separated? So that's one. Um, another key question is, uh, do we have an opportunity to achieve something from our wish list? So in terms of content design or information architecture, right? So were we, did we always want to use Markdown, but we couldn't in the old system, but now we can. Okay, is there an opportunity to implement that into the migration itself? Do we always want to use Ditto? We couldn't in the past, but now we can. Or maybe we could in the past, but now we can't. Okay, so what do we do to plan for those changes? Mm -hmm. um, another thing, uh, is there an automated migration process? And most importantly, does it work? Can we mm -hmm. test it beforehand, right? Yeah. Our, our team has had some experience with, um, you know, using vendors for automated migration. And while it technically worked, 
there was a lot of stuff that kind of went wrong. There were artifacts in the HTML that required us to manually look at hundreds of articles uh, to the point where the next time we just decided to do it ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. So some best practices here. Um, yep. Definitely make a plan and fully test that plan as early as possible, right? So it's easy to make assumptions that certain things are just going to work. We copy this over, it's just going to work. Oh, but now you find that even though you've copied images over, they're still linking to your old system. So you didn't realize that you had to remove every single image manually and replace it to upload it to the new system. So test that plan on a representative sample of articles before committing to your process. Um, another best practice, give yourself time to handle unexpected challenges, right? So estimate how long that migration should take and then maybe increase that by about 25%, right? To allow for unexpected things that come up because especially when you're dealing with large volumes of content, it, you know, you have your plan, but things are going to come up, right? Mm -hmm. Last best practice. Um, this one is easy to overlook for your internal stakeholders at your company. Communicate early and often about your migration, right? So when it comes to clients, it's easy to start diverting them to a new doc portal when the time comes, but it can be much harder to fully communicate and socialize this change internally, you know, especially in a large organization, right? So show off your new site early and often, be transparent. And I would say, share the benefits of this migration in terms of what your internal stakeholders have been wanting, right? So, you know, a recent story from our team, our internal stakeholders always said, man, we wish we could search and limit our search per product line because we have so many of them. And it was always, we had to say, well, you know, you could do this or that work around. After our latest migration, we were able to say, hey, guess what? This thing that you all wanted, you can do it now. And that helps to bring people on board and, and get other people to champion this migration as well. Test, make sure uh, a sample is run before you migrate the actual content. And I think the last one is really cool, which is be, get everybody prepared for a change. Absolutely. Yeah. The more people you have on your side, the, the smoother everything will go. <laughs> Great. You also spoke about some SEO optimization techniques. So would you like to uh, share some of the measures you take in order to make sure the SEO is more optimized post migrations? Because that's one of the big challenges, right? Like you gave an example of images uh, not getting redirected correctly. That's one of the fears I could say for many people resisting a move from their current system. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is part of the planning process too, right? You you want to make sure that your new knowledge base has the tools available to you, right? Especially if it's a, a cloud platform, right? Because if you think about, say, your marketing team, they have full control over SEO of your main marketing site. As a writer going through a CMS platform, maybe you don't, right? But there are still several items that are critical for influencing SEO as a writer. So we have mm -hmm. fewer options than say the marketing team, but we can still make a big impact. So a uh, couple things. So one, being able to write effective SEO friendly content in the editor that your platform gives you. So this means, for example, tools to properly organize your content. Um, how clean is the HTML behind the scenes that Google search crawlers are actually going to be reading? Does your platform give you the ability to resize content and images for mobile devices, right? Mm -hmm. So mobile devices are kind of a first consideration uh, for search engine bots these days. So does your new platform allow you to say, create an alternative homepage for mobile devices, or is it just perfectly resizable so that when, you know, when Google is looking at that, it boosts you for that reason. Mm -hmm. Another thing, um, does your new platform give you tools to control the metadata that's seen by search engines? So for example, things like meta titles and meta descriptions. So mm -hmm. what makes a good meta title is not necessarily the same as what makes a good article title, right? What makes a good meta description isn't the same as what makes a good subtitle. So do you have control over the actual metadata or does the new platform just kind of automate this and just copy and paste your article title, right? Mm -hmm. You can impact your SEO performance by having control over those things. Another, you know, another few things, do you have access to your robots.txt file 
which tells search engines what to index and what not to. Do you have access to that as a writer? Do you have access to your sitemap.xml file? You know, does your knowledge base platform give you that so that you can see the structure from mm -hmm. the perspective of the SEO bots? Um, do you have access to the underlying article HTML so you can make sure it's clean? Do you have access to use tags for internal search? All of these are important questions, right? So it's important, you know, again, if you have full control with your own server infrastructure on an on-prem solution, these things are a given. So it's important when you're working with a cloud-based vendor that you have as much of this control as possible. Um, so as a bonus, uh, any tools that increase accessibility are also a huge win for SEO. So think about, can you add alt text to images in your platform? Um, can you provide user adjustments for colors, font sizes, things like that? So as an example, we use a third party plugin. Uh, uh, it's called UserWay. Uh, it tremendously enhances our accessibility. When you go to our help center, you can increase font sizes. You can do things with images. You can stop animations. You can change the contrast. It, it's just amazing. And so when Google search bots see that, they're looking at accessibility. They're looking at mobile friendliness. Like I said, they're looking at structure and organization. They're looking at metadata. So as a writer, obviously there's a whole world of writing content that's SEO friendly, but do you understand the extra tools that you need to really, to really slay this, right? And then yep. lastly, for us, a key thing. So our help center is on a subdomain of our main marketing site. So, you know, we have access to the Google analytics through our marketing team. So that's really important. I can see what are our highest performing articles, and then I can try to understand why. Are they structured in a different way that's ranking them higher? Or is it just that people want the content from these? And, and we can expand that in our content set. But are there things this article is doing that I can replicate in others, right? Analytics gives you that kind of insight. So there's, you know, that 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 really fires me up, that, that topic these days. Nice. Very nice, David. I think every point you mentioned should be taken with the utmost uh, care and consideration because uh, anybody who's got a public knowledge base, particularly, they would need to make sure these are checked and ticked before making their knowledge base live. You also spoke about uh, the SEO optimization, but uh, during migration, a lot of people struggle with uh, the styles, right? Like what styles they've used and uh, how much time did they spend in making sure the existing content is of good quality so the move can be much more easier. So what are the common styles and quality issues that you come across often and how can we address that? Yeah, that's that is one of those lessons we've learned along the way, right? So so there's two ways to approach this. There's a general approach to style and then there's things that can happen unexpectedly in a migration. So um, I, I, I like this idea in software development of what they call technical debt. And mm -hmm. basically technical debt means like you, you've built something a certain way years ago. You don't really have time to update it for your modern best practices, but it still works. So you leave it in place, right? And I think that we do that as writers a lot, right? Especially if you're a small team with a lot of content. So it can be hard to find time to, to go back and update older content, for example, for newly implemented best practices and design decisions. Well, a migration is a great opportunity to do that, right? So as an example, I mentioned reusable content. Do you wish you had time to re-architect, to leverage reusable content, and you just don't? Well, maybe you put that in your migration plan, right? Um, have you made a change to your style guide and you're implementing a rolling change as you go, right? Have you changed the way that you indicate the breadcrumb trails to get to something uh, in the UI? Have you changed, are you now adding alt text to images where you weren't before, right? And you've got thousands of images, so you're just rolling change as you go. Well, a migration is a chance, and our team actually did this, this exact thing with alt text. Well, if we're migrating and we're touching every article anyway, let's make this part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have time to thoroughly revisit older content to make sure it's 100% relevant, to make sure it's still necessary, right? A migration is an opportunity to do that. Another real world example, um, before we, we had a public knowledge base, several knowledge bases ago, 
our architecture had a tremendous amount of repeated content because everything was very siloed. You go into mm -hmm. this version of the platform and you get this whole content set. You go into this version, you get this whole content set. And as we moved, we found that architecture was no longer amenable to you know newer systems we were using. So we really wanted to reduce the horizontal footprint of our content. We wanted to eliminate repetition, condense content, avoid keyword cannibalization for SEO. And we just didn't have the time to do that. But during our latest migration, we were able to take the time to do that. If we're bringing all this over anyway, let's combine it quickly, get it in there, and then let's take a few iterative passes to make it look great, think about our keyword usage and, and our, our key phrase cannibalization. And that's honestly had a tremendous impact. We've reduced the size of our content by like 40% without missing any information. And mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing that you just maybe don't have time to do. But in a migration, you're in administrative mode, you're in detail mode. Why not stop and do this stuff, right? And and level up your, your quality and achieve some of those wish list items, right? And as I said before, Great. So absolutely uh, well said, uh, David. Um, my, a lot of people think migration is a big task and they kind of try to put it off uh, and even consider using the same old system, fearing of all this additional activity. But as you rightly said, it should be taken in a good way so they can clean up the current content and at the same time enhance the new content with much more rich uh, details and styles. Uh, now, are there any tools or emerging trends, uh, particularly in the content migration space, uh, that you think will benefit our current listeners? Because we spoke a lot about the best practices, challenges of moving contents, but it'll also be interesting to know, have you come across, because you specialize in this, right? That's your key uh, area. So we wanted to hear from you. Have you come across any new technologies or are there anything that you are aware that you can share with us? I do have something interesting, yeah, to share in that area, something where I've improved over the years uh, as I've gone through this and it's automation, um, simple automation with just the basic knowledge of something like JavaScript or Python. So in a migration, you can find yourself doing a lot of repetitive manual tasks, especially in HTML. Uh, here's an example. Some CMS platforms will load up your HTML with style tags, right? Mm -hmm. And those style tags may have CSS classes on them that are completely associated with the styling of their system. So when you bring it over, you can have style tags. Sometimes we had style tags that were five to 10 lines long with these mm -hmm. CSS definitions that were either so specific that they overrode what our new editor was trying to do, or they had CSS classes that were, you know, uh, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, clashing with the new system. So the first time I went through a migration, there was a lot of, oh, this is happening. Let's switch to HTML view. Let's manually highlight all the styles or maybe do a control F to find all the style tags. This time, this latest time, I was a little older, a little wiser. So what I did was I just made myself a very simple script um, with JavaScript where now I can take HTML, paste it in a field, click one button, and it will spit out a cleaned up version of that to just identified style tags and remove them. So it was five to 10 minutes per article. That's now 10 mm -hmm. seconds per article. So when I run across that kind of thing, I pull up my script, do it, boom. So if you have somebody on your team who can take, you know, it took me a day to make that script to save myself unlimited time. You know, if you have somebody on your team who can dabble with that a little bit, or if you can get yourself a developer resource for just a day and just mm -hmm. say, hey, get a list of say, hey, these are the manual grindy things we're doing in our HTML. Can you just write us a little script? It can be quick and dirty. It can be ugly. It can have an ugly UI and mm -hmm. you can save yourself a tremendous amount of time. So just think about that. Right, you have this keyboard at your fingertips. What can your computer do to automate this manual work for you? Um, so, ho hopefully that that didn't scare people off. It's it, it's really helpful. <laughs> so aut automation is the best answer. Yes, yes. Great. So moving on to our rapid fire round, uh, I'm sure you read a lot of contents and um, through various sources. Have you come across uh, anything that you consumed recently? particularly on the documentation space that you can share with us today? 
Absolutely. My whole team were members of the Society for Technical Communication, uh, mm -hmm. STC. Um, and they have, so they've got really great Discord groups and community uh, resources, but they also have an academic journal and a magazine um, that I, I find very, very insightful sometimes. Great, yeah. great. And uh, what is that uh, one word that comes to your mind when I say documentation? My word would be cozy. Um, so then let me explain. So documentation should and can be a pleasant journey of discovery and learning and empowerment. It can, of course, be a source of frustration for users. Um, so it's important to get it right. Right. So documentation that surprises me, makes me feel like I'm unlocking the secrets of how to use this product. Right. And to be empowered to use it effectively. It makes me feel cozy. My, my word is cozy. Right. My last question is, what is that one piece of documentation related advice you would give to your 20 year old self? It is don't be afraid of personal creativity. Um, so I think my 20 year old self was very worried about writing perfectly or the right way. And what that probably actually meant was just emulating what I thought sounded professional or academic as I was in the academic world at that time. You know, now I understand a little older again, a little wiser that even within a framework of a strict style guide and brand voice, there's still room for personal creativity, that personal touch, you know, for, for example, if you find yourself falling into the trap of writing the same kind of things in the same kind of ways, just because it works, right? Introductions, right? Conclusions, introductions to steps. Maybe just rethink it. How can I phrase this in a different way that brings my personal creativity and how I'm feeling right now to the table? Or maybe it's the way you're designing graphics or, or diagrams. That's the kind of thing that can reach that surprise and delight that where you're not sounding robotic, you know, and, 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 and you're bringing that human touch. So don't be afraid of personal creativity within within your role. I mean, we're, we're content creators, right? So be creative. <laughs> yeah, make wonders. Great. So David, it's been absolute pleasure to have you for the last uh, 25 minutes. And uh, we spoke a lot about content migration in the short span of time, challenges, best practices, tools to use, and what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Great. So if there is anything more to add, please take this opportunity and we would love to hear a couple more tips from you before we say bye. Off the cuff, here's a good tip. No matter what stage you are at in your career, whether it's academic, junior, senior, managerial, keep learning. Always see yourself as a learner. Never see yourself as a true expert. If you're always learning, you're always growing, you're always keeping up and you're always, and then turn around and teach others, right? Learn something every day, turn around and teach mentor bring people up and that's how we all get better at this thing together great that's a very very good thought and uh, i really like the way you put that uh, uh, helping the community statement so we all go grow together in the space by helping each other thank you absolutely so david again thank you so much for joining us in this podcast series and uh, wish you all the very best for future migrations I'm sure it'll all go with very well and uh, take care. You too. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, David. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Knowledge Base Ninjas podcast. Please head to iTunes, rate, and provide honest feedback on the podcast. See you next week.